Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first online presentation of the year, year 2022. Our event tonight is John Muir in San Francisco, hosted by, presented by uh, Colette Shaw, which is our talented young guest today. Colette has been involved with the John Muir National Historic Site uh, for a number numbers of years, despite being very young, uh, since 2015. She, uh, as you probably uh, have seen on our uh, website, she received the Pre Presidential Volunteer Service Award for her working, for her uh, work interpreting the, at the National Park Service and was nominated for the Ecker College um, PE Mies Writing Excellence Award for for an essay she wrote on her time at the Muir House. Um, she also um, did a, recorded a, um, an, a podcast on, um, on, um, for the California State Railroad Museum podcast, which is called Round, uh, Roundhouse Crosstalk. And um, the episode that she recorded, it's called Lasting Legacies, John Muir and the Railroad. We all know uh, Jo Muir for her work as a writer, a naturalist, uh, the father of the National Park Service. We, as tour guides, we, we all have visited uh, Muir Woods multiple times. Uh, what we don't know um, much about is the work um, that Jo Muir has done as a businessman. Apparently, uh, he was a very prolific businessman and had many roles in his life. And to, uh, we, we will have a special guest today that will, uh, Colette will tell us about all of some, uh, the story of John Muir in San Francisco. But at the end of the presentation that will last about 30 minutes, uh, we will open um, the Q&A session. So if you have questions related to John Muir, uh, not uh, strict, strictly related to San Francisco, I'm sure that Colette will be, will be able to answer your questions. Um, I would like to remind everyone to please mute themselves until the Q&A um, and Colette, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Many thanks to you, Roberto, as well as to Allison, who took my tour at John Muir National Historic Site this summer and suggested that I come speak to you all. It's always really rewarding to present to other docents and people interested in history, especially those so passionate as yourselves, who are so familiar with uh, the part of the world that I have long called home. Um, I'm sure that as tour guides, historians, residents of the great state of California, you are all familiar already with the name John Muir. Muir was a conservation icon and still holds incredible sway in the conservation narratives and in California history. He is so essentially Californian uh, that he is on our state quarter. One of the most famous members of the first generation of the conservation movement that rose during the progressive era, Muir stands out from the likes of Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot as being a remarkably romantic figure like Emerson or Thoreau. Uh, he was not only involved with the creation of Yosemite National Park, but also Mount Rainier, Petrified Forest, Sequoia, and even Grand Canyon. He wrote in his lifetime 12 books and over 300 magazine articles. Uh, so a somewhat prolific man, despite being a self-described chronic procrastinator, though I won't claim that any of his books are particularly lengthy. Uh, when people come to visit John Muir National Historic Site, they're frequently surprised by the fact that Muir was a long-term Bay Area and San Francisco resident. He's so heavily associated with the High Sierra that imagining him walking up and down the hills in the city is almost laughable. Frequently cited is his famous quote from his book, The Yosemite. Arriving by Panama steamer, 
I stopped one day in San Francisco and then inquired for the nearest way out of town. But where do you want to go? Asked the man to whom I had applied for this important information. To any place that is wild, I said. This reply startled him. He seemed to fear I might be crazy and therefore the sooner I was out of town, the better. So he directed me to the Oakland Ferry. Muir is famous for his antics, climbing trees in windstorms, falling asleep in snowy fields. Uh, but before that, Muir arrived in California in 1868. He traveled extensively throughout the state before settling down in the Alhambra Valley of Martinez, where he married Louisa Strenzel, daughter of a prosperous fruit rancher, Dr. John Strenzel. And he eventually moved into their family home after Dr. Strenzel passed. The home is now John Muir National Historic Site, which I will encourage all of you to visit. Um, he enjoyed taking long walks around the ranch with his two daughters, Wanda and Helen. Wanda is on the left and Helen on the right. You can also see uh, Louisa or Louie, his wife. That's right on the front porch. So if you can come to visit us, you can sit right there. Uh, he taught the girls the scientific names of plants and he spent a lot of time tending to his trees. He was after all a country boy who was born in Dunbar, Scotland and raised on a farm in rural Wisconsin from the age of 11. Uh, growing up doing farm work throughout the day, his father did not encourage him to read or spend a lot of time on pursuits that were not uh, hard labor or the Bible. So Muir had to spend a lot of time on his own sort of doing research building clocks, all sorts of things. Um, but the life of a Martin as rancher suited him well after years of growing up on a farm and tramping in the wilderness. Muir may be suited. But... I think we have some like background noise from someone. Let me double check. Okay, here you go. Sorry yes. about that, Colette. No worries. Um, the, re the reality is, what's that? We good? Cool. Yeah, yeah, we're good to go, yeah. Uh, the reality of being a writer in that time was having connections. Muir himself was rather against the public characterization that he was a hermit locked up in the mountains. This perception was lobbed against him quite readily in later political battles, especially Hetch Hetchy. He was framed as the crazy guy in the woods who didn't care about people, um, but that couldn't be further from the truth while his long treks far from home were a chance for him to reflect, he was a highly social person, a family man, a big talker who treasured animated arguments along with long yarns told around the fire. Um, Muir spent a lot of time in the city of San Francisco. This is uh, Telegraph Avenue in 1868, by the way. I thought that was hilarious. It was an essential and often forgotten time in his life that would define his early works and later political sway. Muir's San Francisco years were punctuated by that frequent travel to the Sierra and the tales that resulted from those isolated trips would be the stories that would define his legacy. But no man can exist in a vacuum, especially not a writer. Without the support of his friends, Muir could have passed into history relatively unknown. He could have never taken his hike with President Teddy Roosevelt, where they spoke about establishing some way to protect the wilderness. Muir's political and popular success can be attributed in no small part to the influence of the people he knew in the city. So 15 years before Muir even set foot in San Francisco, a man arrived there who would become one of his closest friends and allies, John Sweat 
He's kind of a handsome chap, isn't he? He first came to San Francisco in 1853 with the gold rush. He was unlucky at prospecting. That's kind of a common story. He found work uh, as a teacher, public in Public instruction is in fact what Sweat is most famous for. He was the fourth superintendent of schools in California and is considered to be um, the founder of modern California public education. After meeting in 1874, the two men would go on to have a rambunctious lifelong friendship with Muir regularly living with the Sweats in their home on Taylor Street in San Francisco. So, there is Sweat a little further along in years. He founded the predecessor organization of the California Teachers Association, lengthened the school year, established formal grades, uh, certified teachers, and made school free for at least part of the year. He was a somewhat controversial figure at his time, given that free school was a somewhat controversial topic, but so was Muir in his own field. Muir stayed with the Sweat family intermittently between his travels, returning to the house on Taylor Sweet Street to publish articles during the winter months when travel was difficult and spend time with the Sweat children who were fond of his wild stories. Uh, the Sweats would eventually follow Muir to settle mere acres apart in the Alhambra Valley of Martinez. Here are the two men pictured together in 1912 Muir looking characteristically bushy. Uh, one of Sweat's grandchildren would later recall that the two men would cross from one ranch to the other and talk, but they didn't agree. They would argue and argue and argue. For someone who didn't realize these were two strong minds, one honing his mind on the other, it was quite a sight. Once, after a long excursion into the Sierra, Muir returned to the Sweat residence with a pelican wing in hand. They were surprised by this because Muir was never one to kill an animal unnecessarily, but he told them that he happened upon a young boy who had killed the bird and he brought it home for them just so its beauty wouldn't go to waste. Uh, and it hung in their front parlor for years. Sweat wrote one of the most beautiful essays on Muir's life, which was published in the Century Magazine and can also be found on the Sierra Club website. It really helps to understand the kind of affection they had for one another. Um, and it gives a great timeline of Muir's early days in California. So I would encourage you to look it up if you want a really good five minute biography of Muir that was written and completed during his lifetime. He wrote that John Muir has not been a voluminous writer. He chose in his enthusiastic love of nature to be an original observer. He also wrote quite amusingly, it will be pleasant for those of you who read this brief sketch of his early struggles to know that John Muir is now in the happy enjoyment of a home and a comfortable income. Just in case any of you were worried about Muir's well-being in middle age. Let us dig in for a moment to Muir's publications Sweat points out in this very essay on his friend that Muir's first notable articles were published in the Overland Monthly Magazine. Founded in 1868, the same year that Muir came to California, by a Anton Roman, a Bavarian bookseller who made his way to California during the gold rush, the San Francisco-based publication ran under several names until 1935. Um, merging at different points with both Out West Magazine and The Californian, you know. Notable contributors included Ina Coolbrith, California's first poet laureate, Jack London, and even Mark Twain. I love photographs of Mark Twain because he always looks like he wants to fight you. Uh, he commented about the Overland that he heard it handsomely praised by some of the most ponderous of America's literary chiefs. It's very Twain. Muir, in truth, was not someone who found it easy to write. I personally find this to be greatly encouraging. He was apparently so easily distractible that he had to be encouraged to his desk by his wife and daughters who also edited his works. 
a fun side note, Muir so heavily used the adjective glorious in some of his later works that his family would regularly redact it during the editing process and replace it with some adjective, any other adjective. The person who really set off his writing career was Jean Carr. She, but his, she was his longtime mentor and wife of one of his professors at the University of Wisconsin, where he studied biology and geology for a short time in his 20s. He never did, did a, get a degree from there, though he got several honorary degrees later in his life after he achieved some fame. But what he learned then about um, nature was what he used when he was out, uh, as his friends said, botanizing in the fields. So Carr introduced Muir to Emerson, who visited Muir in Yosemite, as well as to Dr. John Strenzel and his daughter, Louisa. Carr was probably meddling a little, hoping that Muir and Louisa would hit it off. They did. <laughs> Uh, not only did Carr make some of the most important introductions in Muir's life, she would also send the letters that he wrote her to publishers and urged him to speak more broadly to the public about his concerns in Yosemite Valley. The logging, building, and floods of sheep greatly disturbed him, and she, he told her as much in their correspondence. While he was living in the valley uh, in his young life, he worked as a shepherd, he helped build a sawmill that processed trees that were laying around on the forest floor. Um, but as time went on, more and more people were starting to move up that way. And it was changing in front of Muir's very eyes. Carr herself would actually go on to become a professor at the University of California. Um, but moving into public life was a difficult jump for Muir. He had no interest in fame. Even after his essays took off, he was offered positions at several prestigious universities. And he said that there were already plenty of professors in the colleges and few observers in the wilderness. That he wanted to be more than just a professor, whether noticed in the world or not. I think it would be nice if more people nowadays had that same sentiment. In the end, Despite his best efforts, Muir ended up published in the New York Tribune, Century Magazine, Harper's New Monthly Magazine, the Boston Weekly Transcript, The Atlantic, and later the Sierra Club Bulletin, a sparkling career for someone who never wanted to be a writer. In addition to the books he wrote and others that were published after his death from the many journals that he kept uh, throughout his life and his travels. Muir was the first president of the Sierra Club. He served from its founding in 1892 until his death in 1914. The Sierra Club, though I'm sure you are all familiar, was founded to protect Yosemite Valley and advocate for the wider preservation of nature, especially in California. The idea for its formation um, was actually drummed up in San Francisco uh, at a meeting between Muir, Warren Olney, who was apparently an important San Francisco attorney, Dr. Joseph LeConte, the first president of the University of California, and William Keith. There's his moody portrait. A prominent landscape artist and long-term friend of Muir's. While they were at Keith's San Francisco art studio, um, they all came up with the idea that they should form a club to protect the Sierras the Sierra Club. Um, I know that Keith had a printing shop on Clay Street. I'm not sure if the studio was in the same location, but I'm imagining that it was the same place. William Keith, like Muir, was Scottish born. He was a very well-respected painter who made landscapes of California and the High Sierra. He made lots of dreamy woodland paintings and mountain views that surprisingly sold really well in his lifetime. That is kind of unusual for an artist. Um, some of which are currently on display at St. Mary's College, as well as I believe the Oakland Museum. I think I've, I've definitely seen some there. 
Um, it was actually Keith's relationship with Muir that resulted in Keith being at St. Mary's College. In 1908, a monk by the name of Brother Cornelius Bragg visited Muir um, and saw some of Keith's paintings hanging in Muir's home. Brother Bragg was so enthralled by these works that he ended up writing a 900 page biography of Keith uh, and collecting over 100 of his paintings to keep at St. Mary's where Bragg was a professor of art. So if you go to John Muir National Historic Site today, we do have a lot of replicas of Keith's paintings of Yosemite that are hanging up around Muir's home in kind of similar places to where Muir would have had them when he lived there. Muir and Keith actually met in Yosemite Valley in 1872 when they were both 34 year old recent immigrant Scots uh, was an introduction from the one and only Jean Carr. She was really good at making sure that Muir made the right friends. Uh, they would maintain a tempestuous lifelong friendship, as we've learned from the accounts of the friendship between Muir and Sweat. Muir apparently loved friends that he could argue with. Uh, Muir and Keith would take extended hikes together, sketching and journaling in Yosemite, and Keith would return to his studio in San Francisco and turn his sketches into paintings. Keith produced a shocking 4,000 oil paintings in his lifetime, some of which were massive pieces that would take up a whole wall. Um, he considered Thomas Hill, one of the other great painters of that time to be kind of his rival um, and there's also a replica of a Thomas Hill painting that is hanging in John Muir National Historic Site as well. Um, so more than half of Keith's paintings were lost when the studio burned down in the 1906 earthquake. Um, this is unsurprising considering that 80% of the city was destroyed if you own something in San Francisco in 1906, the odds were good that you wouldn't later. Um, the quake actually did affect Muir's home in Martinez. There was significant damage to one half of the house, prompting Muir to return home uh, from a trip to South America. He got a letter from his family, essentially saying, hey, John, please come home. The house is falling down. You need to fix it. He used the opportunity to renovate the East Parlor so if you visit the house, the East Potter Parlor is actually a lot more modern. It has an entirely different fireplace that Muir made much bigger than traditional Victorian fireplaces. So lots of people would have the opportunity to sit around and have conversations and tell stories. Um, and there's much less decorative trim than in the rest of the house in the high Victorian style that Muir's in-laws chose when they built the rest of the home in the 1880s. But I digress. Back to Muir and Keith. The foundation of their arguments was that Muir believed that Keith was often not true enough to his subjects, moving in his later years to paint more impressional, impressionistically and romantically. You know, there was fewer perfect portrayals of rocks and more mist. Uh, they had this big argument about sunsets where uh, Muir said something along the lines of, Keith, you've never seen a sunset like that before. Why don't you just imitate the one you saw yesterday? And Keith said, well, wake up tomorrow morning and you'll see nature imitating my sunset. Um, this bothered Muir, the botanist, and Muir, the man who believed that valleys and mountains were better temples than anything man could render. You know, he believed that nature was something God created and God given and far better than anything we could hope to make. Um, this was also an issue considering the fact that Keith was illustrating Muir's book, Picturesque California. It was a coffee table book of sorts that Muir was editing and it had various different artists uh, painting and etching and sketching different parts of California. Um, Keith, on his part, 
took umbrage with Muir's long descriptions in his writing and suggested he cut some of the more loquacious bits. Neither took the other's advice. James Mitchell Clark, author of The Life and Adventures of John Muir, described their 38 year friendship as one in which deep affection and admiration were expressed through a kind of verbal boxing, counter jibe answering jibe, counter insult responding to insult. That is an incredibly familiar sentiment to the firsthand account of Muir's relationship with Sweat, if you ask me. They would argue and argue and then not speak for a bit, but then inevitably one would invite the other on another hike. In 1907 and again in 1909, Muir invited Keith to come with him um, on his few final trips to Hetch Hetchy Valley in the Sierras, 150 miles from the city. This was a high honor considering Muir was at the time fighting for the valley to be saved from development. Hetch Hetchy Valley is known as one of the greatest losses in conservation history. Muir lauded the place as far more beautiful than Yosemite. Unfortunately, rather than a pristine mountain temple as Keith portrayed it here, um, it re represented an opportunity uh, for the city of San Francisco. So in the year 1901, San Francisco mayor James Phelan, who has kind of crazy eyes, suggested damming the valley for drinking water. He was also the one who purchased the land necessary to route the water to the city through the East Bay. Muir protested adamantly, along with the Sierra Club, defending the valley in 1903, 1905, and the issue rose again in 1907. The political battle and inevitable vitriol that would extend through multiple mayorships of San Francisco um, was sort of epitomized by Phelan. He has some of the most interesting quotes about the detestable Mr. Muir, though Muir did call him James Phelan, Satan and Company. This cartoon and its familiarly bearded subject are rather self-explanatory. People saw Muir as trying to stop progress, the inevitability of the march of time and the needs of the people. Um, but Muir saw this attack as one on the very nature of beauty and life. After the 1906 earthquake, the urgency of providing the city with more fresh water became incredibly apparent. Um, the peninsula had grown faster than the infrastructure could support and hoses ran dry during the fire. However, contrary to what some politicians would have you believe at the time, this was because water mains under the street were broken, not because the city did not have enough water to run its hoses. Some attempt was made to attach hoses together and run them from the bay, but it was all kind of fruitless and the fire is what caused most of the destruction in the city. Um, so after that, uh, politicians kind of used it as an opportunity to begin the campaign in earnest to dam Hetch Hetchy and route the water through Central California to the city. Hetch Hetchy was perfectly equipped to become a lake. As you can see in the photograph, it had a wide flat bottom and tall canyon walls. It was in essence a natural bowl. It was also free of the contamination of livestock. It had spectacularly clean Sierra water flowing down from the mountains straight from the national park. Um, and it was undeveloped. So there would be no need to buy land out from under farmers. Um, because San Francisco is a peninsula, there's little available fresh drinking water. And San Francisco was stuck under the monopoly of the Spring Valley Water Company for bringing that kind of stuff into the city. Uh, Mayor Phelan had umbrage with this because he was, he was considered him sort of the, the people's mayor. He was, he was a reformer. He wanted to bring as much as he could to the city. Um, Phelan commented that John Muir loves the Sierras and roams at large 
and is hypersensitive on the subject of the invasion of his territory. The 400,000 people of San Francisco are suffering from bad water and Mr. Muir could please cease his quibbling. I, I find it amusing that San Francisco has only doubled in size. I suppose it is a peninsula, so there's not really that much room. Um, he also said, and he, John Muir, is a poetical gentleman. I'm sure he would sacrifice his own family for the sake of beauty. He considers human life very cheap. Muir returned on the whole debacle. The present flourishing triumphant growth of the wealthy wicked, the Phalans and their hirelings will not thrive forever. We may lose this particular fight, but truth and right must prevail at last. Muir was right in that they would lose that particular fight. In 1908, the rights to develop the Tuolumne River were granted by Theodore Roosevelt, Secretary of the Interior. Though much of the debate continued into the Taft administration, the project was finally signed off ultimately during the Wilson administration, even though thousands upon thousands of letters arrived on Congress's doorstep sent by Muir, the Sierra Club, and their growing collection of public supporters. Because it was public land, it had to be an act of Congress. The Raker Act was signed, stipulating that the dam could be built if no private parties made money from the deal. And work on the project began in 1914. The dam does work spectacularly. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. Hetch Hetchy water is incredibly clean and still throat flows through taps today. San Francisco is one of the six cities in the United States not required to filter its tap water, uh, though I believe they do anyway. I'd be curious to know what the other five are. I don't know if you'll find this part interesting, um, but I do. The dam is 312 feet tall. It was raised in the thirties. Uh, the river flows through multiple powerhouses that create electricity that is sold to Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Um, which many have claimed is a violation of the Raker Act and are using to uh, push for the undamming of Hetch Hetchy. That's something that a lot of people are, are considering nowadays. Um, it goes down the Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct uh, before reaching the Bay Area. It passes through a tunnel near Fremont, gets stored in multiple different reservoirs around the Bay, and then splits into four pipelines, all of which cross the Hayward Fault. I might add. Um, two pipelines go under the bay, south of the Dumbarton Bridge, I believe, and the other two go to the South Bay. The battle over what would happen to Hetch Hetchy became truly the first nationally reported environmental debate. You may be wondering why it was Teddy Roosevelt, Secretary of the Interior, who signed off on letting this happen. After all, it was Teddy who had supported Muir's vision of creating national parks in the first place. In the end, they differed on what they thought the national parks were really for, providing protection for man's resources um, or preserving natural beauty for the betterment of man's spirit. We cannot really blame Mayor Phelan for his intentions. He was a reformer looking out for the public good, trying to improve people's health and break up monopolies, but on the other hand, as Muir said, damn Hetch Hetchy, as well as damn for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches, for no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of man. Muir took one last Sierra Club outing to Hetch Hetchy in 1914 before they broke ground and died that December at the age of 76. But as you know, Muir left behind quite the legacy. Publications still widely read to this day, a spirit of dissent in the face of progress, uh, and the impression on the American mind that I doubt we will ever forget. The debate over what the national parks and what wilderness are for still rages on, um, but I think it will be a good while before we really sort out our priorities on that one. 
before I open things up for questions. I want to encourage you to visit John Muir National Historic Site in Martinez, as well as St. Mary's College Museum of Art in Moraga. I believe the Art Museum will reopen on the 16th with a new exhibition, um, but the Keith paintings are a part of their permanent collection, thanks uh, to that brother. Uh, as for the Muir House, we're open every day of the year except for Christmas Day, Thanksgiving, and New Year's Day. All other days the house is open for a self-guided tour. Um, and if you want to learn more about Muir's friendships, I would highly recommend the book John Muir, Family, Friends, and Adventures by Sally Miller and Daryl Morrison. Um, a lot of pictures from this presentation can be found from that book as well as on the Sierra Club website. I'd also like to extend a thank you to the rangers at Muir. Please go by and visit them. Thank you, Colette. Thank you for such a brilliant presentation. You're, you're a great public speaker. You have a future as a public speaker. Thank and um, we, um, I would like to invite everyone um, to think about if they have any question for, for Colette. Uh, we have a, a few on the, on the chat, which I'm gonna read first. And then uh, after we have done, we are done with the, with the first few questions, feel free to unmute yourself or turn on your video and, and ask Colette directly, okay? So the first question is it's from Jason uh, Cohen, which it's complimenting you for the presentation. And he's saying uh, it's controversial, but can Colette comment on the issue of Muir's opinion of Native Americans? I don't know if it's something that you have uh, researched about your Muir's as well. I don't know a lot. I know a little bit. Um, technically, right now, I'm not employed by the National Park Service. So his opinion of Native Americans was not good. Okay. Uh, he believed that they were encroaching on wilderness just as much as any people who were traveling from the West um, and that they didn't belong in national parks. So a lot of people credit Muir kind of with this idea that um, national parks should be places of pristine beauty without the influence of man at all. Um, but there are a lot of places in the world where man is just as much uh, as a part of the ecosystem and has been for 200,000 years. So, you know, such is, such is the turn of the clock. Right, that's very uh, surprising to me because the, the Native Americans were the first one to take care of, of you know, what we know today as uh, mere woods. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's very, uh, very unusual something I didn't know. And next question, can you tell us about Muir's descendants? Yes, um, so there are a lot of them. Helen and Wanda each had, I believe one had six children and the other five, I'm not quite sure. It was upwards of five for both of them. And um, all of them each respectively had a bunch of kids. I know uh, that some of them actually changed their name, their last name back to Muir um, because, you know, they both, he had two daughters. So their, their uh, names would have originally been changed. Uh, I know he had one grandchild whose name was Muir uh, as a first name. And then all of his siblings changed their last names back to Muir, but he wouldn't because he didn't want to be Muir Muir. <clears throat> So Helen actually ended up moving down to Southern California and living in the town of Daggett, uh, which if you know where it is, I would be surprised. Um, but she had bad lungs. And what do you do in the late 1800s to early 1900s, if not move to the desert when you have bad lungs? Wanda remained in Martinez for a good while and actually lived in the Martinez Adobe for a short time behind her parents' house. There are actually a lot of Muirs who are still around. None of them particularly famous, though I think some of them are still kind of connected to the Muir story. Okay. 
Next question by Alexa Shane. He's saying, um, he, he, he's saying, um, how have perception of Ju John Muir changed over time? He obviously experienced great fame and controversy during his life, but how has he been framed over the years until now? That's interesting. I mean, his perception had changed a lot in his lifetime. Um, you know, of course, after he died, people forgot about the political controversies and they leaned in to remembering him as an American hero. But Muir has indeed, in the past couple years, had a reckoning, especially with how he treated other people um, and how he talked about people of other races. It wasn't pretty. But I think the National Park Service and also the Sierra Club are making commitments to kind of acknowledging the places in history where Muir was just wrong. Okay. And uh, we, we don't have any other question on the chat. Um, so if anyone else want to ask Colette uh, anything, uh, about John Muir, not necessarily related to uh, her presentation, or uh, feel free to unmute yourself and and ask directly to Colette. Anyone? Don't be shy. I know we had one question about uh, Muir's childhood. If you All right, like the up upbring upbringing, yeah, by Linda, yes. Yes, so I, I spoke a little bit about his um, childhood in Wisconsin. It was a complicated one because religion was very much pushed heavily on him as a young boy. He memorized the entirety of the New Testament and much of the Old Testament. Um, and he remained a religious person sort of throughout his life. And you can see that in his works, especially where he uses the adjective glorious over and over. Like, oh, this is nature. It, it is the glory of God here upon earth. Um, but in other parts of his life, he also kind of rejected formal religion in some ways. Uh, he writes about God being more of a, of a symbol than a man with a beard uh, and something about uh, God being a more interesting make-believe thing than a puppet at a puppet master's show. Um, but you can definitely still see sort of the, the remembrance of his childhood religion throughout his works. He had a very tenuous relationship with his father. I know he went to visit him sometime in his 20s. And when he was leaving, his dad gave him the bill uh, for the money he spent while he was there two weeks. He was like, you ate this much porridge and you slept in this bed, so I'm charging you rent for visiting your family for two weeks. Um, and Muir was like, that, that's enough, wow. dad. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna come visit you anymore if you keep acting like this. And he only saw him one more time after that before his father passed. But he did retain good relationships with his many siblings who did come to visit him in California. Um, and gain, you know, some positive life experiences themselves. They all, they all turned out all right. The, the childhood was a little rough. Is it possible to visit his, gra his, his, his grave site? Is it, is, is it possible to visit the grave site? Yes, sort of. So he, he's buried nearby the, the Muir house. Um, and it used to be that people would come all the time asking to go, but it's, it's on Park Service land, but it's at the end of um, a little private street and they didn't uh, have a way to bring people there without messing with the neighborhood. But we just started doing gravesite tours. I'm not sure if we're still running them at the moment, uh, but we were this summer. So you can book an appointment to go out there and they unlock the gate and take you back to see Muir, um, and the Strenzel family, so a few a few relatives from that side who were buried on a plot about a, a mile from Muir's home. Okay, I, I heard someone um, was uh, about to ask a question, so feel free to uh, ask the oh. question to Colette. Um, Colette, it's just a follow about um, Muir's childhood. You said it, and what I've read, it was just so 
um, extreme reading the Bible on a regular basis or daily. How did your deal with religion or belief system? It, was it all about Yosemite is, is, is our glory under God with his children as a father? Interesting. I have not read a okay. lot of that, but I do know that he, de he definitely remained religious and he definitely saw religion in nature. But I read Helen's diaries um, and I see not a whole lot of that religiosity that he had. Um, so I think he definitely imbued in them a respect, but there's, there's certainly no memorizing of the entire New Testament for Helen and Wanda. He would prefer that they memorize all the Latin names of grasses. We have another question from uh, Don Delora. What was the state of the relationship between Muir and Kent when Muir died? Really Easy. good. Really good? <laughs> well, you know, it went, it went back and forth, but in the end, their, their fights were silly. And that's, that's the way a lot of Muir's relationships were. He liked people who challenged him and who rose to the occasion and made him think. Um, so when he, when he fought with his friends, they would quickly reconcile. After all, they were fighting about, uh, you know, what to do about public school and how, how to paint a rock. Anyone else want to ask a question to Colette? No? Okay. Um, and can, could you, uh, as to conclude the your your presentation, Colette, could you repeat what you told us before we actually started recording the event about how many sites are named after John Muir in San Francisco and, and California in general, and the fact that despite you know he was born in in Scotland, grew up in Wisconsin, he's considered you know uh, known to be a truly California symbol icon, right? For sure. We were talking about this uh, before a lot of you uh, logged on and joined the recording. But when I was doing some research for uh, the podcast that I did on Muir and the Trains, I found that I believe it was 211 or 217 things were named after John Muir in the state of California, be that hospitals, parkways, elementary schools, uh, dentist office parks. Um, which is why some people occasionally ask me, so when did he found the hospital? We, we have a way of uh, projecting Muir onto everything here. And he's quite famous in California, but relatively unknown in other places. When you're working at John Muir National Historic Site, you pe have people walk into the home from Indiana or West Virginia or New York who ask who John Muir was. You know, they, they think of the national parks and they think of Teddy Roosevelt. But Muir has, too, in the past couple of decades, really started to get traction in his hometown of Dunbar, Scotland. They have um, like a Muir trail as well through there. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of Scotch people are now starting to, <laughs> to remember Muir and appreciate his legacy as well. Wonderful. And um, lastly, as we tour guides at the end of our tours, we, we like to share gratuities with, with, the, with, the, with the presenter. Is there any way we can share our gratuities with you, Colette? Sorry, I haven't asked you this before. Do you have like a, a Venmo or PayPal account where we could send our gratuities to you? Oh, yes, lovely. Could, <laughs> could, you, could you tell us uh, which, uh, which will be the best way? Um, I have a PayPal and I believe it is um, C-H-A-C-O-L-E-T-T-I-E. -T -T -I, -E. I can drop it in the chat if you like. Yeah, I could also share with everyone um, when we send out the recording and I, I, will, I will make sure they, they will receive your email and contact Thank you so much. And All your duties will be going right to my student loans. Right. Because you just, if you didn't know, Colette just graduated, actually. So congratulations. 
Thank and, you. And thank you so much for uh, your presentation. Um, and when you are back in the Bay Area, please let us know so maybe we can we can come over. Actually, we will we will continue the conversation with you and the Park Rangers, hopefully, and maybe we'll be able to visit the site in person as a group. That would be lovely. And, yeah, thank you so much uh, again. And so if there's no other question, I think we can conclude the event and uh, have, a, have a great uh, weekend, everyone. And uh, stay in touch. Thank you, Colette. Bye-bye.